Welcome to the Heavy Lies the Helmet Podcast. So, uh, my name's Dan Rao. I um, flew for about nine years at the University of Cincinnati as a flight NP. And I just retired just recently, and now I'm an intensivist in the ICU, and I um, am one of the podcast guys at a Heavy Lies the Helmet. So uh, we're going to talk about metabolic acidosis, and I always have to give my housekeeping rules at the beginning. I will, into, as I get older, when I was young, my filter was this thick just because I was young. And then as I was reached my sort of middle years, I need to remain gainfully employed, so I had to thicken that filter out. And then as I've gotten older, you know, it's gotten a lot thinner. So I will endeavor not to offend or hurt anybody's feelings, but I mean, we're at risk of that happening. But if, so if it happens, I apologize. It was not intentional. And you can come up and say, hey, when you made fun of whatever, that kind of hurt my feelings. And I'll try to leave that out the next time. So, all right. So if you have questions, for God's sake, ask. I, the people in the front of the room, I always count on you guys to be the barometer. So at some point, like during my talk, I'll look over at you and I'll look for, I'm looking for some kind of a guttural sound to let me know that you're, like, you're still following along. So if I get to something that's particularly complex, I'll look at you and if you just give me a, uh, then I'll know, oh, all right. I mean, everybody's kind of following and then we'll just keep moving. If something doesn't make sense, I ask that you take the same approach that I did when I was in nursing school. And that is, I didn't buy any books because those things were too dang on expensive and I, didn't, I wasn't really sure I wanted to do it that much, but I needed something to do when I wasn't working at the firehouse. So I just sat in the front and I just paid really close attention. And as soon as they said something that I was like, ooh, I don't get that, I'm like, hey, whoa, uh, let's say that again. And that kind of kept me on track. So do the same thing if we talk about something you're like, what the heck? How can you have three metabolic, how can you have metabolic acidosis and alkalosis in the same patient? That's nuts. Stop and ask. Roger that. All right. <laughs> Good. Good. What, copy that. That's right. Okay. All right. So this, I'll just give you the full disclosure. This talk really is called Kicking the of Metabolic Acidosis, but that was offensive, so I had to change the name to the I can only... You, I mean, you heard it, whatever that was. So I just pulled that out like I was literally on my tractor at my farm. And, and Erica said, you, you got to change that name, though. I'm like, oh, uh, I looked over and saw, you know, my food plots. I'm like, what's a good? <laughs> so um, this was the original name of the talk. So what the heck's this all about? What it about is we're going to talk about what is an anion gap acidosis. We're going to teach you how to do the Henderson-Hasselbach equation and the winner's formula in your head. Holy crap. Um, we're going to solve multiple complex equations. We're going to identify the presence of a hidden third metabolic disorder because truly you can only understand or you can only see what you can understand. So if you don't understand it, you'll never see it. And to understand stuff that nobody else does. And it is truly, that is truly the truth. I suspect that if you went to the average ER physician in a non-academic center where they just, you know, don't publish papers all the time, they are not going to feel comfortable at all identifying triple acid base disorders. No way. So the important part about that is that you can't fix things that you don't identify. And you will be surprised how often you encounter patients that have triple acid base disorders all the time. So... This will talk about how to sort of locate those things. So we're going to do all this through a series of uh, complex calculations and super complicated biomedical concepts. That's why I got the jacket on, because, right? So um, I have a sort of a question really as to frame this talk. What's the difference between a critical care nurse paramedic and a flight nurse paramedic? A thousand pictures like that. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> All right. I always worry when I do large talks that uh, whoever that person is will be in one of my talks today and they'll be like, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> All right. So I've learned over the years that if we don't at least briefly talk about simple blood gas analysis, people get lost pretty quickly. Because while everybody thinks that they understand um, blood gas analysis, maybe we all don't have the greatest uh, comprehension and ability to just look at a blood gas and go, bam, it's that. 
So we're just gonna touch just on some basic, basic, basic stuff. So as a brief review, remember that the pH and the PCO2 go in opposite directions. The primary disorder is respiratory. And it really is just that simple. So you, when you start out, I teach my NP students that um, go with me in the ICU, just get a piece of paper, use arrows. And if they go in opposite directions, you immediately know it's a primary respiratory problem. And if they go in this, and the pH and the bicarb go in the same direction, it's a metabolic process. And that really is the basis for everything that we're going to talk about, right? So I just have a little chart that we'll just go through quickly. Um, respiratory acidosis, obviously, because it's acidosis, the pH is down, right? The PaCO2 goes up, you'll notice very quickly as you're an astute group that those arrows are pointing in the opposite direction. So you know this is gonna be a primary respiratory acidosis and the bicarb, nobody cares about it in a primary respiratory acidosis for the primary disorder. So we're talking about for the primary disorder and we know it's the primary disorder because it drives the pH. So as soon as you look at the pH and you see that it's 7.1, then you know this is the primary disorder is going to be an acidosis. And then the next place you look is at the PCO2, and if it goes in the opposite direction, you're like, oh, that's a respiratory acidosis. If it's a metabolic problem, those will go in the same direction. All right? So metabolic acidosis, the pH goes down. Nobody cares about the PCO2 because it's metabolic, at least for the primary disorder, and the bicarb goes down. Yeah. Respiratory alkalosis, pH goes up, PCO2 goes down, and nobody cares about the bicarb. So this is simple stuff, right? Oh, yeah, very simple, very simple, very easy. All right, metabolic alkalosis, pH goes up, nobody cares about the PCO2, and the bicarb goes up. So I endeavor to explain things very simply. I use lots of analogies. Everybody calls them Rowisms. It's like an alternate language. Courtney, the two girls up front here, Hacker and Courtney over there, worked with me at the University of Cincinnati. So they were my partner lots of times and became uh, very adept at cleaning up my messes, both uh, interpersonally as well as uh, aesthetically within the base. They would always, before we'd lift off, they'd always do the, like, you know, we do an RSI checklist. They do the, did Dan leave any equipment behind checklist? They'd look around, all right, there's the airway bag, looking around like the telepod, all right, we're good to go. Or like, oh, where's, where are the IV pumps? So, so right, <laughs> where the cot, right. So I endeavor to keep things simple. So um, I'd like to follow the complexity chart where you uh, solve for X, and there it is, right? So as simple as possible. So I'm gonna endeavor to do that as we proceed. If you have taken acid-based classes, whether it be in paramedic school, nursing school, or both, you saw lots of charts like this, right? You know, they're teaching you about acid-based, and you see charts like that. Immediately, if you have any sense at all, you know that you hate this topic, right? Because you look at stuff like that, you're like, who is entertained by this? When I was a police officer, I went to uh, accident reconstruction class at Northwestern University. And if you know anything about that, it's tons of crazy math. The cops initially think it's just a great way to have a side gig making, you know, extra money. So they, you know, everybody signs up for this and you go and sit down and the guy comes in the first day and he has this whiteboard and he flips it over and there's like crazy calculus physics stuff and half the guys literally just grabbed their book, flipped it over and just got up and walked out like, yep, not for me, I'm out of here. So acid base can be kind of the same way, right? You see lots of stuff like this and if it doesn't make you feel like that, um, I don't know what you're doing because um, it can be kind of crazy. So we're going to try to keep it very simple. So I believe it's one of the most misunderstood concepts in modern civilization. It is very simple. And people who understand things pretty well always tell you things are simple. And then you get at the end, you're like, yeah, it wasn't simple at all. I think when you're, we're finished here today, you'll say, I think it's pretty simple. So everybody likes cases. We're going to start with a case. Everybody likes a good case, right? So your flight crew called to transport a 24-year-old male from a rural podunk hospital um, back to a tertiary center with a diagnosis of DKA. It's important you know what podunk means, obviously. So podunk, 
Uh, the word origins actually comes from an Algonquin Indian word. It says it's the name of a tribe that inhabited an area near Hartford, Connecticut, and it's a swampy place. So that's the, the uh, official uh, definition. The Merriam-Webster definition is a small, unimportant town, and the Urban Dictionary says, uh, <laughs> so um, I, can, I can talk about podunk towns because I live in one. This is the central business district in the town that I live closest to. That is beautiful downtown Cedar Grove, Indiana. That's the financial district. It's the Cedar Grove Tavern on the left. And that is an abandoned building on the right. And then the marathon's around the corner and that's it. All right. So uh, that is the definition of podunk. So your patient is a non-compliant type 1 diabetic who's been regulating his blood sugar with actually one of the newer long-acting insulins that you guys might, be, might not be familiar with. It's better than Lantus. It's called methamphetamine. Um, so pretty common, right? I mean, you see this all the time. I mean, diabetes is a bad enough disease, especially if you don't take your dang on insulin. So, um, so on his arrival at the outside hospital 30 minutes ago, he responded to loud verbal stimulus, and those were his vitals. One air 56, heart rate's 144, respiratory rate's 32, his temp's 37.1. All right. His labs, sodium's 122, his K is 6.5. His chloride's 88, CO2 is 5, BUN's 50, creatinine is 2.6, and his shoe gear is 645. And then you can see his blood gas, right? So to characterize his current clinical condition in a picture, um, <laughs> he is uh, in a situation, right? He's acidotic. He's tachycardic, he's hyperkalemic, and he's he, on the edge of being hemodynamic unstable. He's got a heart rate almost in the 150s. So let's talk about complex biochemistry concept number one. It all starts with the BNP, or BMP, I'm sorry. If you have been in medicine for a while, you've at least been exposed to the fishbone chart. I encourage everybody to use it, but the, pre the struggle with it is people can never remember what goes in what column. Um, so that is sort of a barrier to entry, as they say now. So if you understand where the columns come from, it makes it a lot easier to remember it, right? So the primary cations are in the first column. Cations are the plus signs. The primary anions are in the second column, the negative signs. The renal function's in the third column. And the shoe gear is on the end because there's no place else to put it. All right? So that's how, um, that's a very simple, quick way, rather than writing sodium 145 on each thing, you just draw out a fishbone chart and you got it and it's a graphical representation. Everybody should know what it is and if they don't, shame on them and you got it, okay? All right, so remember cations are positive. The more and stronger the cation, the more little positive thingies up in the superscript. So sodium and potassium are the primary ones. Anions are negative. That's chloride and CO2. Uh-oh. All right. And those will equal out every single time. So your body demands electrical neutrality. Got to have it, will have it every single time. And if it has to kill you to do it, that's fine. It's more than willing to do that. But it demands electrical neutrality. So all of the acid-base disorders that you have ever seen are all a result of your body equaling out the daggone positives and the negatives. That's where that all comes from. And it will make adjustments in your ability to live based on that. So your body induces changes in the pH to maintain that electrical neutrality. Okay. So complex formula number one, the gap. Everybody gets kind of wrapped around the axle when they have to do equations. I'm a simple man. I like simple things. So I do not utilize the potassium when I calculate the gap. You just take the primary positive, which is sodium, and you subtract the chloride and the CO2 from it. It's that simple. And that is the difference. The gap, the anion gap, represents the difference between cations and anions. 
thus the anion gap. Now, if you were paying attention, even though it's 8.05 in the morning, uh, you just heard me say that your body demands electrical neutrality and the positives and the negatives will equal out. So how in the heck can you have an anion gap if the positives and the negatives have to equal out? Well, how you can do that is because at the time that we came up with this concept, there were unmeasurable ions that we didn't have the ability to measure with laboratory analysis. So what we did is built in, not we, what was done is they built in a fudge factor that accounted for those anions that you couldn't quantitatively identify in lab analysis. And that fudge factor accounted for those anions. So when you took the positives and then you factored in the unmeasurable anions and the measurable anions, it equals out and the gap goes away. All right, so let me show you what those are. All right, so in calculating this gap, you have a sodium of 140, you have a bicarb of 25, and you have a chloride of 105. So you take the bicarb and the chloride, that's 130, minus the sodium of 140, the gap is 10. Yeah, perfect. all right, perfect. He says perfect, right, good. So we just talked about why is there a gap? The gap, the unmeasurable anions were albumin, lactate, and keto acids. So that's what fills the gap. So at the time when this concept was developed, you couldn't measure albumin, lactate, and keto acids. You can now. So when you factor in, in any given patient, you add up the chloride, the CO2, which is the same as the bicarb, and then you add in the factors of keto acids, albumin, and lactate, the gap is closed. All right, so those, so that tells you then that if you have abnormal levels of albumin, lactate, or keto acids, you will have an acid-based disorder because your body is going to make those changes to account for too much lactate, keto acids, or albumin. Affirmative. Yeah, affirmative. Got it. All right, so we're tracking. Does that make sense? Right? Pretty simple? Yeah. Yeah. Sure it is. Sure it is. All right, so now you have this patient, this any given day, any given patient, and you have this um, these set of lab studies, and a new weak acid is introduced into the body. So he now um, has, is exposed to some acid, whether it be his keto acids go up or he develops some lactic acidosis or whatever. So when that happens, that those anions have nowhere to go, so it adds the hydrogen ions and it's buffered by the bicarb. So what happens is, you see the bicarb is 25, right? So that new acid is, uh, is added to the body, the bicarb goes down by 10, and the gap goes up by 10. It's a linear equation. So the way, the way I want you to think about this is how your body induces those changes. You have this little guy sitting on your kidney. He's got a fishing pole with some litmus paper on it. And as the blood goes by, he just takes a little fishing pole and dips it down in the blood because he's monitoring what's going on. And as he dips it down, he's like, oh, too much acid. He reaches behind him in one of those 25 buckets of bicarb, takes it, throws it in the blood, keeps dipping. Blood keeps coming by, like, yep, still not right. Reaches back, grabs another bucket of bicarb, dumps it in there until the pH is normal. So what's going to happen is either he's going to deplete those bicarb stores he's got, to make the pH normal, or he's gonna run out of bicarb. And then the pH is gonna go crazy because there's nothing to buffer it at all. So that's how the metabolic component of this works, right? Yes? Copy that, Copy that. good. All right, so we're moving along. We're moving um, in, in good speed. So that makes the anion gap 20. Linear, equ linear equation, for every one that the bicarb goes up or down, the gap goes in the opposite direction. Okay. So, you have um, a basic BMP. What is the anion gap? 
22. Normal anion gap is 15 or less. So when you see a gap of 22, immediately you know you have a metabolic acidosis. Not only do you have a metabolic acidosis, you have a wide gap of metabolic acidosis, which implies there is some other kind. And there is. There is a non-gap metabolic acidosis. You're never going to fix metabolic acidosis if you don't know, A, first of all, that it's there, and B, if you don't know what kind it is and what's causing it. That seems pretty linear and logical, right? All right. So we're just going to run through a couple of these. This tends to be the hardest part of the whole class. You have people, you know, with every varying levels of education and they struggle with like basic math because, you know, we don't do it anymore, right? So everybody's reaching for the phone. <laughs> so what's the gap? 35, right? See? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> it happens, right? So the gap's 35. So immediately, before you go any further, you're like, yep, it's got a wide gap metabolic acidosis. All right, gaps 12, you get the idea, right? So there's two types of acidosis, gap and non-gap. So you will see it's, it is perfectly acceptable to abbreviate it, just WGMA, wide gap metabolic acidosis. So let's talk about where, like I said, you're not going to be able to fix it if you don't know what causes it. So the mnemonic I'm going to teach you is mud piles. There is a new one. Not really a new one, but there's a new way of representing it. It's called Goldmark. Um, I find med mud piles is just simpler, and I'm about making this simple. You know what General Patton said, never come up with a plan. So ingenious, the troops can't figure it out, right? So I like to keep things simple, and you're still going to identify 95% of the cause of why get metabolic acidosis. So mud piles is a mnemonic, obviously. M is for methanol, toxic alcohol. Uremia, DKA, peraldehyde. Peraldehyde is a drug that we used to use a long time ago. Nobody uses it anymore. You're never going to see it. It has really nothing to do with this, but it wouldn't be mud piles without it, so we just left it in there. Right? Simplicity. Um, iron or isoionazide. What is isoionazide for the trivia question of the first half of the presentation? Does anybody know what isoionazide is? Does anybody know what INH is? Oh, that's a drug for TB, right? So um, that is one of the causes of wide gut metabolic acidosis. Lactate and ethylene glycol. What's ethylene glycol? Antifreeze, right? Okay. So that is mud piles. I will tell you that largely, if you have a wide gut metabolic acidosis, it's the vast majority of the time, it's going to be uremia, renal failure, D, DKA, L lactate. The majority of the time it's going to be one of those three reasons. There are times when it will be others and you have to account for that, but largely those are the first places to look. And salicylate overdoses, which are obviously not nearly as popular. So, so step one, when you're proceeding through what the heck's causing this metabolic acidosis, the first thing I always want you to do is calculate the gap. And the way you remember that is every time you calculate the gap. Every single time. And that way you don't ever forget it. You got to do it every time. Even on people that aren't sick, even people you don't think are sick, even at two in the morning, you just calculate the gap on every patient. And then you don't miss anything, right? So calculate the gap. If you have a gap, step two is you must immediately calculate the osmolar gap. Now, nobody in their right mind that looks at that slide likes that kind of math, right? So you just use MedCal. <laughs> or come up with some program that will help you. But you've got to calculate an osmolar gap. And that's because if you have a wide gap metabolic acidosis, one of the potential causes are toxic alcohols, methanol or ethylene glycol. And those, if you have an intoxication of toxic alcohols, you will have an osmolar gap. The osmolar gap will be elevated. If the osmolar gap is elevated, then you have to assume that toxic alcohols are at least some component of the acidosis and you have to treat for it, all right? And the treatment for that is a drug called fomepazole. It's cheap, it's free, people like it, it makes them dance, and even the littlest podunk hospitals are going to have fomepazole. So you just give it and then you're covered. Even in big centers, um, most of the time, ethylene glycol and methanol levels are send-outs, so you're not going to get it back immediately, it's not going to help you, so you just give it, all right? Just prophylactically give it. 
Um, there are other ways, you, if you're a toxicology whacker and you like this kind of stuff, you've heard about the thing with the Woods lamp. Has anybody heard of this, the Woods lamp and the Foley bag? Because ethylene glycol has fluorescein in it. That's the stuff that gives it that crazy green color. And there are occasions where you can hold the Woods lamp up to the Foley bag and you'll see the fluorescein like flickering around like in a neon fashion scintillating in the Foley bag. Um, I have seen that before, but you may also not see it. So if you see it, it probably is ethylene glycol, but if it's not there, it doesn't mean it's not ethylene glycol. So it's really more just of a trivia question, kind of one of those cool things that, you know, you can talk about and people think, man, how did he know that? But it's not really that helpful. It's kind of like the Osborne wave. You know, if you're using the Osborne wave to identify hypothermia, the ship's probably sailed and you're not on it, you know, <laughs> right? Okay, so use MedCalc. If there's a wide gap metabolic acidosis, do an osmolar gap. All right. If there is a met wide gap metabolic, or if there is an acid, the patient's acidotic metabolically, and they have a normal gap, then they have a non-gap acidosis. The non-gap acidosis has another mnemonic, right? Hyperchloremia, acetazolamide. What's acetazolamide? What's their name for acetazolamide? Right, diamox. It's a uh, diuretic that we use in the, if you work in the ICU, we use it for contraction alkalosis or they use it for altitude, cerebral edema from altitude, um, or Addison's disease. Renal tubular acidosis, that's a different kind of kidney malfunction at the junction. Diarrhea, everybody's familiar with that, right? Yep. Um, ureteral diversions, which are kind of a crazy, it's like a uh, colostomy for pee um, in simple terms and that can cause a non-gap metabolic acidosis and pancreatitis. The most common cause is, if you think about when you take care of DKA patients, you have somebody that comes in with a pH of seven and a bicarb of five and the emergency department, God love them, gives the obligatory three liters of battery acid and in an attempt to uh, rehydrate them and their gap closes but their pH only minimally improves. That's because they've just converted their wide gap metabolic acidosis to a non-gap metabolic acidosis. So they've traded the ketosis for hyperchloremic acidosis because of all the chloride in normal saline. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, like earlier on, I'm like, does that make sense? You're like, yeah, yeah, roger that. Got it, got it. Now I'd say that, does that make sense? You're like, <laughs> kind of look to the guy next to you and you're like, uh, kind of. All right. So it's a non-gap acidosis. The most common cause of non-gap acidosis is hyperchloremic acidosis. And that's from given normal saline. Why is that, you say? Has anybody ever seen that? It's a bag of normal saline. I call your attention to this right here. What's the pH of a liter of normal saline? Right. So you don't have to be a biochemist to know that if the body's normal pH is like 7.35 to 7.45, and you give somebody a whole bunch of stuff with a pH somewhere between 5, 6, that that's not really going to be that good for them. Now, in most cases, your kidneys can take a joke. You can beat them with a boat oar and they come right back, <laughs> largely. So that's how we get away with it most of the time. If you have sick kidneys, you may not get away with it. And then you get this thing called CRRT, right? So minimize the chloride load if you can. This is like my ongoing battle with the emergency department of my hospital. It happens every time. Because what, in fairness, I think what sometimes happens is they just obligatorily just give everybody normal saline. You know, it just rolls off the tongue. It's like if you go to the urgent care, they're like, hi, need your copay. Here's your Z-Pack. Um, it just rolls off the tongue. You know, it's got a beat and you can dance to it. Um, normal saline's the same way. You know, welcome to the emergency department. We're going to give you a liter, a liter of normal saline because it's physiologic. It's the most like normal body fluid, except for that thing with the acidotic stuff. So it is not physiologic at all. So they give this normal saline, and then they realize the patient's acidotic. And now they have to do the walk of shame. Like if you intubate somebody, and then you realize the blood sugar is 20, you know, it's the walk of shame. So same thing. 
And then they realize they've just made the problem worse. So when they call me to give a report, uh, I say, how much fluid did you give? Three liters. I'm like, it wasn't normal saline, was it? Well, I gave one liter of normal saline, and then I gave lactated ringers. Just give the tank on lactated ringers, for God's sake. Let's talk about the potassium thing with lactated ringers. Have you heard, of course, that if you give lactated ringers to people that are hyperkalemic, that that's bad because it's got potassium in it? Somebody's heard that, right? Yeah. It don't work like that. It's a gradient. So the equivalent of potassium in lactated ringers is about 4.5 milliequivalents. So if your K is higher than 4.5, it will actually bring your potassium down. If your K is lower than 4.5, it will actually um, push it in the other direction. So you can give lactated ringers to people with K irrespective of what their K is. Don't give it another thought. And publicly shame people who think that you can't give lactated ringers to people with hyperkalemia because it's not true. All right. So we know that normal saline is, is essentially the physiologic equivalent of battery acid. So we don't want you to give that. Okay, so non-gap acidosis. Is it RTA? Um, to calculate if it's RTA, you have to do a urine anion gap. That's an ICU thing, don't worry about that. Just have heard of it and know that RTA is largely diagnosed by a urine anion gap. There are multiple kinds. There's distal, proximal, hypoaldo, lots of you know, ICU, nephrology, mumbo jumbo. You don't have to worry too much about that unless you really like nephrology kind of stuff. But uh, just know that RTA is a cause of non-gap metabolic acidosis. Second most common cause of non-gap acidosis, diarrhea. So if somebody's pooping through a screen door for a few days, they're likely to become acidotic. Let's talk about this thing, the bicarbonate buffer system. This is why given bicarbonate is not the most clever approach to treating acidosis in most cases, right? You have too many hydrogen ions. That's called acidosis. You give this thing called bicarb. It creates this thing called carbonic acid, water, and CO2. When you have too much CO2 in your blood, that's called respiratory acidosis, right? If CO2 is too high, you have a respiratory acidosis. So when you give bicarb, you make CO2. So when you have somebody who's acidotic and you give them bicarb, you are dumping a bunch of CO2 on their blood, which will make them more acidotic transiently. If you don't believe me, which probably only a third of you um, will, um, next time you give bicarb, if you have somebody on waveform capnography, just look at what happens to the waveform capnography as you're pushing the bicarb. You'll watch the number go up instantly. So it's dumping a CO2 load on them. So you don't want to give IV push bicarb is not your friend unless you are convinced that they're actually going to die from their acidosis. So IV, I'll just give you my, there's evidence for this but I'll give you my bias. If the pH is greater than seven, there's no role for IV push bicarb, period. If the pH is less than seven, there's a limited role. If you can get a bicarb drip, you're far better off to use a bicarb drip than you are a bicarb bolus, because the bicarb drip more slowly diffuses in, the CO2 is created more slowly, and it gives the patient an opportunity to blow it off. So if you have a person who's in DKA because they have pneumonia, and they're in hypoxemic respiratory failure, and their pH is low, and you push bicarb, if their respiratory capacity is impaired to the extent they can't blow off that CO2, you're gonna make their acidosis worse by giving them bicarb. Okay, important concept. So I had this kind of love-hate relationship with bicarb, um, and I think you should too. Yeah, all right. So. In the presence of a wide gap metabolic acidosis, you have to consider complex formula number two. And that is the rule of 15s. So what you wanna know when you have somebody with a wide gap metabolic acidosis, it is the body's normal physiologic mechanism to try to compensate for that. If you have a primary respiratory problem, the compensation is metabolic. If you have a primary metabolic problem, the primary compensation is respiratory. So obviously if the respiratory system's failing, it can't bail itself out or it would have already done it. So it requires the metabolic system to do that. Likewise, if it's metabolic, the respiratory system has to bail it out. So what you wanna know is when you have a wide gap or a non-gap metabolic acidosis, you wanna know 
is the respiratory compensation adequate? Because we know if you've been, watch all the, the uh, airway lectures, you know about hop killers and you don't, want to ask, you don't want to intubate people who are acidotic because if they are, have a metabolic acidosis and they're tachypneic trying to compensate for their metabolic acidosis and you jump in with uh, a paralytic and a sedative, you're going to take away their compensation and their acidosis can get worse. If their acidosis is profound, you can kill them. That's why, you know, we know that the, a couple of the good ways to get a good, quick, clean kill in critical care medicine is we intubate hypotensive people. That's why we call anesthesia the propofol assassins. Um, so um, if you intubate hypotensive people, you're going to make their um, hypotension worse and they will probably die. Likewise, if you try to intubate people who are profoundly acidotic and you don't match their compensation, they're going to get worse and they're at risk of death. So you don't want to just jump in and willy-nilly be intubating people who are acidotic just because they're real sick. And I ain't had an airway in a while. So, um, so you want to know when you look at the blood gas, is their compensation adequate? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing to try to fix their own problem? Because that matters, right? If you have somebody whose compensation's adequate, then you let them ride, let them go, right? If their compensation's not adequate, then you need to do something to enhance their compensation. The final pathway for that, obviously, is intubation, which is a dangerous proposition, right? So how do you know if their compensation's adequate? It's very complex, requires a lot of math, very difficult. It's the roll of 15s. So if the bicarb is greater than five, in the BMP, because the BMP is the only bicarb you care about. Don't look at the, the bicarb in the blood gas. It's calculated, it's not real. So you look at the bicarb in the BMP, and that's the CO2, right? It's dissolved in plasma. So you look at the bicarb in the BMP, and you just add 15 to it. And that should be the PCO2. So if they're bicarb 7, you add 15 to it. Where I went to school, that's 22. That should be the PCO2. If their PCO2 is greater than 22, they are not adequately compensating for their own metabolic acidosis. And you need to inspire them to fix that. Does that make sense? Uh, you didn't even look to the side that time. Yeah, but does that make sense if I just look down? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll do some, uh, some problems. So if the bicarb is 5 or less, then it just, the corollary is just 15. So if it's 5 or more, you add 15 to it, that should be the PCO2. If it's 5 or less, it's just 15. Okay. And if it is, the secondary disorder is a pure compensated respiratory alkalosis. So you would have the primary disorder is, a, for instance, a wide gap metabolic acidosis, and there is also a respiratory alkalosis. So they have a dual acid-base disorder. Wide gap metabolic acidosis, for instance, respiratory acidosis. <coughs> ah. All right, if it doesn't, if that PCO2, so if the PCO2 should be 22 and it's 30, then you have a primary metabolic acidosis and a primary respiratory, or the other one, if it's too high. If it's too high, then you have a primary respiratory, or primary metabolic acidosis and a primary respiratory acidosis, because the PCO2 should be 22, and let's say it's 30, then you have a dual disorder. You have a primary respiratory acidosis and a primary metabolic acidosis. We'll do some problems that will kind of hopefully seat that concept. All right, so what's the gap in this particular situation, in this particular harbor in uh, homage to Jimmy Buffett? What's the gap? 20. So primary diagnosis is you have a wide gap metabolic acidosis, all right? Then we add in a blood gas. The, PCO, or the, B, the CO2 is 10, so you add 15 to it. So the PCO2 should be 25. It is 25, so you have a primary wide gap metabolic acidosis and a secondary 
respiratory alkalosis, right? Because it's compensatory. Does that concept make sense? We're going to do a bunch more, but I just got to make sure the concept makes sense because that's like a formative principle in this. All right, next one. What's the gap? Seventeen. All right. Now we'll add in the blood gas. The CO2 is 12. You add 15 to it. What should the CT CO2 be? 27. 27. It is 27. So the primary disorder is what? <coughs> Wide gap metabolic acidosis. And the secondary disorder is respiratory Compensatory respiratory alkalosis, correct. What's the gap? 10. So what's the primary disorder? There may not be a primary disorder. The gap's normal, right? So, but the pH is 7.29. So immediately you know what's the primary disorder. It's a non-gap, right. It's a non-gap metabolic acidosis. What's the most common cause of non-gap metabolic acidosis? Hyperchloremia, right. Okay, so now you get a gas. The CO2 is 15. You add 15 to it. What should the PCO2 be? 30. It is 30. So you have a primary non-gap metabolic acidosis and a secondary compensatory respiratory alkalosis, right? All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. What's the gap? Yes, 26. That's right. Um, <laughs> I can see the gears grinding. <laughs> Add two numbers to two numbers. Ooh. All right. Everybody's vagaling down. All right. So the gap's 26. There's the pH. Look at the PCO or the CO2. It should be. What should the PCO2 be? 15 and 9 is 24. What is it? 30. 30. So is the compensation adequate? No. So you have a primary wide gap metabolic acidosis and a So you have a no, so you have a primary wide gap metabolic acidosis. The compensation is inadequate. So when the compensation is inadequate, you have another primary disorder. And that primary disorder, when the PCO2 is too high, what do we call that primary disorder? Respiratory acidosis. So you have a wide gap metabolic acidosis and a primary respiratory acidosis. You have a dual acid base disorder. They have a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis. That's different than a primary metabolic acidosis and a compensatory respiratory alkalosis, right? It's worser, right? Yes, much worser. All right. All right. Gap 30. The PCO2 should be 15 and 7. The PCO2 should be 22. Instead, now it's lower than it should be. When, the PC, when, they, when it's lower than it should be, that means they're overcompensating, right? There's no such thing as overcompensating. So when you see evidence of overcompensation, that tells you that it is, when you see metabolic alkalosis as a second primary disorder, it salicylates or sepsis. All right. Complex formula number three. Now we get to the triple acid base disorder. We're coming down the home stretch. All right, so you got the primary and secondary disorder. So the, the triple acid base disorder, and like we talked about, it was linear. For every one change in the anion gap above normal, the bicarb goes in the opposite direction. Wow. So for every one change, the bicarb should go in the opposite direction. 
So that, now you have to calculate the delta gap, which is just the difference between the two. So let's do a problem. All right, so what is the gap? Eighteen, yes. All right, so the gap's eighteen. Now, what should the PCO2 be? Twenty-one, because we don't care about the bicarb in the blood gas, remember, because it's calculated. So you add fifteen to the bicarb on the BMP. Fifteen and twenty-one is thirty-six. So the PCO2 should be... 36. Instead, the PCO2 is 44, so it's too high. When the PCO2 is too high, that's called respiratory acidosis. So you have a primary wide gap metabolic acidosis. You also have a primary respiratory acidosis. All right? So the normal gap should be 15. In this case, the gap is 18. The result is it's 3 too high, right? So the bicarb should be 3 too low. The normal bicarb is 24. The actual bicarb is 21. It should be 3 lower than normal, and it is 3 lower than normal. So you do not have a triple acid-base disorder. The bicarb has gone down as much as it should for the degree of acidosis. Does that concept make sense? All right. So the bicarb to anion gap ratio is one to one. The delta is three on both sides. The, the insult is three. The compensation is three. No triple disorder. So there's no third hidden metabolic disorder. Here's a, what's the gap? 30. Primary disorder is a wide gap metabolic acidosis. Oh, what's the compensation? So the PC, the, you take the bicarb, is 20. You had 15 do it. Should be 35. What's the PCO2? 35. So the respiratory compensation is adequate. So you have a primary metabolic acid, a wide gap metabolic acidosis, and you have a secondary respiratory Alkalosis, right? So the normal gap is 15. In this case, the gap's 30. It's 15 too high. It means the bicarb should be 15 too low. So in this case, the bicarb is only 4 too low. So it's 15 too low and the bicarb's only 4 too low. So why would the bicarb not be as low as it should be? because they had too much to start with. So the bicarb is 15 too low, but the bicarb, instead of it being 24 before whatever happened to this person happened, it was much higher. So they had a pre-existing metabolic alkalosis. Classic case is somebody with COPD that's, a, that's normally hypercapnic. Right, so he's normal hypercapnic, so how does he buffer and keep his pH normal if he's normally hypercapnic? He retains bicarb, so he walks around the bicarb at 35 or 38 or whatever. So when his bicarb is 24, that's actually what for him? A metabolic acidosis for him because he normally should be 35. All right, so it's 11 too high. So his bicarb should be 15, but it's actually 24. So it's too high. So when the bicarb's too high, we call that alkalosis, right? Everybody looked down that time. They were like, didn't even look side to side, just head straight down. <laughs> All right, so it's a, he had a metabolic alkalosis. So the summary of this is he has a primary anion gap metabolic acidosis. He has a secondary respiratory alkalosis. In the third disorder, he has a non-GAP metabolic alkalosis. 
Very good, you caught it. There is no such thing as a non-gap alkalosis. It's just alkalosis. That's the making sure the guy in the front of the room is paying attention to what the heck's going on. Good man. I was, fr I was afraid the guy in the Ohio State shirt would have a negative impact on you, but you're powering through it. All right, so let's go back to our case and talk about where the rubber meets the road. So we have this guy, what is his gap? The anions are all in the same column. They're already lined up for you, for God's sake. So 20, 122 minus 93. So his gap is, I'm sorry, I overclicked. His gap is what? 122 minus 93, it's high. Can we agree on that? We won't split hairs, let's just say it's high. So it's a wide gap metabolic acidosis. Why do you think he has a wide gap metabolic acidosis? Because the sugar's high. So where's the acidosis coming from? From ketosis, right? And maybe for some lactic acidosis, we don't know that because we don't lactate, but um, he's got a wide gap metabolic acidosis. Now let's talk, what's his compensation? Bicarb's 5, so when it's 5 or less, the corollary is 15, right? So his PCO2 should be 15. It's not, it's 30. So he's failing compensation, right? Now, let's look at the compensation. So his bicarb's 5, the PCO2 is 30. His CO2 is 30. So his PCO2 should be 15, instead it's 30. So that's failing compensation. So he has a primary wide gap metabolic acidosis. He has a secondary respiratory acidosis. Right. Is there a triple acid base disorder? His anion gap's 29. The anion gap should be 15 because it's 14 too high. CO2 is 5. The CO2 should be 24, it's 19 too low. We already talked about that. So the delta is five too low. So he has a respiratory acidosis. I'm sorry, he has a wide gap metabolic acidosis. He has a respiratory acidosis. And he has a non-gap metabolic acidosis. He has a triple acidosis disorder. That's much sicker and much worser than if he just had a metabolic acidosis and his respiratory compensation is adequate. But if you don't know the rule of 15s and you don't know this, how to do the delta gap, you would miss the secondary respiratory acidosis. Because what happens? Previous to this, you just look at somebody and you're, you could probably figure out he's acidotic because the pH is 7.1. Everybody gets that. That's the low hanging fruit. But then you see his PCO2 is low, you know, normal is 35 to 45, and you see his PCO2 is. 24, and you would always say to yourself, oh, well, that's, he's just compensating for his metabolic acidosis. But if you don't know the rule of 15s, you would miss the fact that his compensation sucks, and it's not what it should be. That's worse physiologically for him, right? And if you don't understand a triple acid-based disorder, you would never miss that he has a third hidden underlying metabolic acidosis on top of his DKA. So, guy's much sicker than just another non-compliant diabetic guy who's just, you know, we'll give him some fluid and he'll be fine. Well, maybe not. So that's somebody you have to watch much closer and do something different. You go to improve his respiratory compensation. So maybe he needs non-invasive, maybe he needs some Narcan because, you know, he self-medicated before he got there, or his respiratory compensation is inadequate. So it leads you down kind of a di little bit of a different road, all right? So... We just talked about that. All right, so on every patient, you check the gap and you do it every time. That way you don't miss it. You use the rule of 15s to identify a respiratory compensation or a second primary disorder. Oh, you remember the one-to-one -one for the delta gap? And if the gap is up, the bicarb should correct by the same in the opposite direction. Who's that? Do we have some stat medevac people? Shame on you if you don't know who that is. He's from um, the, the mothership of Stat. Is, Stat is it still like in Pittsburgh somewhere, right? That is Randy Pausch. He was an animatician from Carnegie Mellon University. Their 
have it there before a professor retires, they give them the opportunity to do the last lecture. The last lecture is their opportunity to tell people, other faculty and students, what they learned in their career and what they can do to be, you know, have a, a better, more fulfilling career. And in his last lecture, he had pancreatic cancer and was dying. And that's why he had to retire at such a young age. But uh, he um, closed with this saying. The brick walls aren't there to keep you out. They're just there to give you a chance to show how bad you want it. So that's my message for you as you leave here is uh, use those brick walls to show people how you want it. Everybody has uh, barriers that come up, power through it. Remember, you have the greatest friggin' job in the world, right? You're the, uh, the, hopefully the best part of somebody's worst day. Never lose sight of how important that really is. That a great flight, a cool flight, lots of cool procedures is life-changing for somebody else. Don't ever lose sight of that.